Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this second section on language. Now in the first section on language, we saw what is language, we saw how it differentiates from uh, communication and we saw several parts of uh, language, how it is made up of, uh, what is uh, a syntax, what is a phoneme, what is a morpheme. Um, and then what is the semantics, what is pragmatics. So, basically that comprises of what a language is and then at the end of it grammar. So, basically what language is, what it is composed of, how uh, these things, uh, the rules of grammar really work into language and uh, so on and so forth. Now, in this section we will focus on to something called understanding comprehension of language and the production of language. So, first section was describing things about the nature of language and the second section is about producing language and understanding comprehending language. So, basically let us start uh, this session and try and understand how language is comprehended, how language is understood or how language is produced. Now, language like any other information which is being transferred from one person to another is uh, basically first taken in as a raw input so, and it is uh, transformed. So, uh, uh, the basic components of language are first uh, perceived through a language processing unit in the brain and uh, then it is uh, the raw materials or the uh, raw parts of the language are then processed by this language processing uh, unit to form meaningful representations, where these representations then mean something or have some semantic value. Uh, now, the steps uh, which are followed in taking in the raw language input and then processing it, so that a meaningful representation, a semantically meaningful representation is uh, created, what are the steps into it? Let us look into uh, those. So, the question is how does speech perception happen? how do we perceive speech. Now, as opposed to perception of words, uh, which we do uh, one word at a time, uh, one by one. So, how, how does word perception happen or uh, perception of letters and numbers happen? So, basically what we do is, we do some kind of uh, uh, fixation and we do some kind of uh, uh, jumps and these fixation and jumps happen from the first word to the uh, first letter of the word to the last letter of the word, then there is a gap and within that gap the meaning of the word is, uh, is uh, evaluated and then we go to the next uh, word. And similarly, in terms of speech perception, since uh, perception of words happen this way in, in visual materials happens in the, the way that I just described. So, it is basically believed that speech perception should also follow something like this. And the simplest way to look at how speech perception would happen is uh, to be like text perception that is one sound at a time should be perceived and the pauses between uh, the, a spoken word, two spoken words should be used to identify the meaning of the words. This is how a general knowledge should be because text perception basically takes place as I said you, it takes place in terms of uh, word by word perception. So, the first letter of the word and the last letter of the word is basically uh, looked into, uh, this is called uh, jumping or fixations which the eye does and based on that uh, there is a gap and if there is no gap then uh, uh, perception of letters become difficult, but uh, this gap between letters actually help the uh, brain to interpret the meaning of the word and so this goes on and this is how the meaning is generated. So, uh, in speech perception also it should be uh, we assume that it should be similar that 
a word by word is perceived each word that somebody is speaking. Now, when I am speaking to you uh, the perception should work in this way that you should be uh, perceiving each word and the gap in my speaking the time gap between two words when I s speak that should be utilized for making meaning out of it. So, that is how uh, we believe it is, but that is not how actually it really works. So, Milner 1990 he described two problems with such a theory which says that uh, word by word perception happens and meaning is generated from uh, those kind of words. And what is these two problems? First, Milner he found out that speech was continuous in nature, the uh, nature of speech was continuous. And so, how does it happen? For example, uh, refer to the spectrogram. So, I will what I will show you is I will show you spectrogram. So, what is the spectrogram actually? This is an output of speech. So, once once you uh, produce speech uh, the uh, there is a air pressure. So, um, just in front of the mouth. So, when, once the uh, words come out of your mouth a certain air pressure is created and this air pressure is measured through a uh, instrument and then it is displayed in uh, through a spectrograph through a CRT tube or a spectrograph and that is how what is a uh, basically a spectrogram is. So, the amount of pressure which is generated when you speak certain words against when you do speak nothing is presented on an x y coordinate in terms of voltages in in in, in terms of uh, sounds and in terms of uh, the sound in hertz and on the time axis. So, that is how a spectrogram really works. So, a spectrogram is basically these pressures that I emit when speaking a word uh, and the graph of it which is uh, in terms of sounds in the produce in terms of hertz and uh, the uh, with through a particular time period. So, I am just going to show you a spectrogram of the word that I have written down here. So, they are buying some bread. Let us look at this. And if we find obvious uh, uh, stops or obvious gaps in the spectrogram, it would mean that speech is not continuous and so each word after each word there is a gap. So, let us look into it. So, spectrograms uh, uh, this is the spectrogram as you can look at and so when you look at the spectrogram it is one continuous um, the em emission or one continuous graph which is out there. So, on this axis we have the time and on this axis we have the measurement of sound in terms of hertz right. So, air pressure basically in terms of hertz and so what is the result of this? The result of this is that spectrograms indicate that rarely there are pauses around each sound. So, once a sound is produced there are no pauses uh, between them and uh, rather different sounds from the same words blend into each other. So, what happens is when I say they are buying the bread what really happens is the end of the and the beginning of R are blended together and so there is no gap and that is what Milner pointed out he said that speech is continuous. So, assuming that speech is like perception of text is not correct. One reason being that it is continuous I just showed you that this sentence they are buying some bread in terms of a spectrogram how it will look like and we see that the word endings they sort of merge into each other and so there are very few chances or there are no chances for gaps between them which, uh, which uh, negates the idea that people get time to uh, be between spoken language to make meaning out of it. Now, the second problem which Milner listed is the fact that a single phoneme when if it is changed into a spoken text uh, the context changes. For example, if I remove uh, uh, if a to a do and o to can be made these words can be made by replacing the t d and o phoneme. So, a single phoneme if taken out or if it is replaced or if it is misheard in certain way what would happen is the word would itself change and so one single phoneme one single speech sound and phoneme is a very basic idea. So, one sim simple uh, problem with hearing this phoneme uh, would actually lead to the interpretation or would actually lead to a uh, different interpretation altogether. And so, uh, what I have here is that this uh, same phoneme. So, you have uh, this is for to, this is for do and this is for auto and as you can see here that this is the time axis in terms of time as you see it is 200 400 millisecond and this is the pressure air pressure. So, in terms of sound pressure in terms of hertz or cycle per second and so what you see is that the same kind of spectrograph you can see for both 
uh, door to an auto, but only the beginning changes. So, uh, replacing a phoneme, for example, T replaced by a D or a O, the beginning of this changes, but more or less it is the same, right? And so that's what it is. So, fun for phoneme changes, the whole idea of the word or the whole meaning of the word changes. Now, these are the two facts why it, why uh, sound perception cannot be uh, similar to speech perception. Now, another problem which is to be noted is that men and women they speak in different frequencies, different accents and across different contexts. They uh, people speak in different ways. So, it is not about gender, it is not about how uh, women and men speak together, it is also uh, dependent on the kind of frequency. So, some people speak very softly, some people speak a uh, little bit loud, the kind of accents that people use. So, it could be a raw accent, it could be a toned up accent or any uh, uh, reason or different situations. For example, so in, in a lecture you could be whispering, in some other for when you are lecturing it could be a monotonous tone and so on and so forth. So, across context, across different different situations people both men and women use different kind of um, speaking or speak differently and so this could be another problem uh, which could lead to the fact that speech perception is not like text perception. So, then if it is not like text perception how is speech perceived then? What is the way in which speech perception happen? And the answer to this is that speech perception is generally categorical in nature and that is what it is. The answer is that we come specially equipped with, per, uh, with uh, systems which perceive uh, speech in an efficient way, in a very efficient way and that is called categorical processing. So, what happens here is that certain categories are automatically made and so when we speak the speech is automatically without awareness pushed into these categories and that is how we actually go ahead and process speech. We pay attention to certain acoustic pro properties of the speech and ignore certain others. So, based on the acoustic properties we can tell whether a person is male or female. Remember uh, uh, experiments from the attention section where we saw that from the uh, unshadowed air people were able to tell uh, things like the tone of voice and the gender of the person who is speaking. And so, these uh, things are automatically attention is paid on to it automatically and so people were able to uh, tell from the non shadowed ear also. So, basically in categorical processing what really happens is there are certain categories and these within these categories uh, in, uh, when you when a person is speaking automatically we perceive or we force the spoken speech into these fixed categories and this happens without awareness we are not really aware of the fact that we are doing it. So, we are not perceiving it in a continuous manner, we are not perceiving it in a breaked out manner, but what we do is certain categories are there. So, what is a noun, what is a verb kind of categories or different different categories or what could be uh, the constraint category and so we look into speech or we to hear speech and we take parts of speech and they uh, we then go ahead and then push it these parts into different different categories out there and that happens without of uh, any kind of uh, awareness with the kind of uh, explicity into it. So, perception of speech is also affected by something called visual cues uh, and these are uh, known as context effect. So, certain kind of visual cues in the environment they also affect kind of perception of speech that we do. Now, uh, an, ex an experiment was done to show that these different things uh, that context affects perception of speech and so Warren what he did was he presented a statement like this to people. Now, the statement was the state governors met with their respective uh, it should actually be legislatures, right? And so that is what it is. But where the word uh, uh, legis, the word s would, the phoneme s would come, uh, he produced a coughing sound. So the statement runs as the state government met uh, with their respective legislatures concerning uh, in the uh, gov uh, covering, convening in the uh, capital city. So this is what uh, the basic sentence was. And so what he did was in the word legislature, where this phoneme would be a cough sound was produced, a light calf sound was produced and it was amazingly people were not able to identify the calf sound. Only 1 out of 20 people actually <coughs> they reported hearing the calf sound. 19 people did not uh, uh, didn't actually report the calf sound and they could hear the word legislature very nightly, nicely and uh, the phoneme s here legislature. So, phoneme s and this basically is what is called the 
phoneme restoration effect. So, in which 120, so that is what it is. So, uh, so this sentence was presented and 120 millisecond portion was replaced. The, this was the 120 millisecond portion where a phoneme was there and a coughing sound was induced. So, 1 out of 20 percent listening to this actually found out that there was a missing phoneme and most of the 19 people restored this phoneme and that is called the uh, uh, phoneme restoration effect. And that demonstrates that the, the, percep the perception that we actually do is uh, categorical in nature. So, we do not look for uh, look through word to word, we actually uh, force implicitly or uh, without awareness, we force part of sentences into uh, preformed categories and that is how perception of speech really happens. So, the answer to this or uh, the result of this experiment was that people were capable of using a great deal of information to predict what the correct sound of the missing segment was and as I said that people were able to restore this phoneme, they did not notice this break which was there and we, because they were doing categorical processing, they were not even aware of it that this has been replaced by a cough sound. Now, Warren Warren in 70, they demonstrated this by presenting people with one of the four sentences. So, they people, uh, presented people with these four sentences. Now, each one was the same recording with the exception of the final word has been spliced off uh, and uh, each contained a missing segment as indicated in the asterisk sound. So, basically what Warren did, Warren Warren did was to find out whether people are able to restore this phoneme or not or perform this phoneme rest restoration which basically means that are people capable of implicitly filling up gaps into spoken speech to demonstrate that what uh, Warren Warren did was he presented four different sentences to people with one phoneme being spliced off and what he wanted to see was whether people restored these phonemes or not. So, there were four sentences present to people with a missing segment and each of this in each of this the missing segment is the key to making meaning of the sentence. So, what were the sentences? The first sentences was it was found that eel was on the excel, the second was it was found that star eel was on the shoe and so this star which you see here is basically the missing phoneme here and so I am pretty sure by now you would have come to know the answer for all of these and so this was what was replaced. So, in in, uh, in first case this eel was related to an axle, in the second case this eel was related to a shoe, in the third case it was related to an orange and in the fourth case it was related to a table. Now, take a second and tell me what the eel should actually be. And I am pretty sure that you would have come up with an answer. So, in the first case when an axle was presented, the context helped people to replenish back or to fit in the right phoneme and so people perceived wheel there. But in, in the second case where it was uh, the shoe, people did not say wheel, but people perceived the e e l, the, the, the part where the phoneme was spliced off as heel. not wheel. Now, wheel was for axle because the axle is the context and so wheel was replaced in if shoe is the context then what was replaced was heel. But in the third case when orange was the context when orange was what was being referred to the missing portion became peel whereas in the fourth case when table was what was the context or what was uh, uh, the whole sentence was referring to it was meal correct and that is what it is and so depending on the sentence participants reported hearing wheel, heel, peel and meal. So, basically they restored this phonemes names of uh, uh, w h, the h h in heel, the p in peel and the m in meal. This kind of thing is there which basically again proves the hypothesis that people perceive uh, speech sound automatically and implicitly and how they do it? They do it through something called categorical processing right and so it is a speech perception is basically not like text perception people do not wait over speech uh, segments and the gaps between speech segments are not utilized for making meaning rather the perception happening in a categorical automatic manner. Now, with the perception of speech or speech itself there are certain errors which are there when we produce speech also. So, certain errors can also arise when production of speech happens. So, uh, so, beside perceiving speech from others, we also produce speech and to uh, 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 for others to comprehend 
uh, the um, and process the speech we are. So, it is not only always listening, we all uh, sometimes also talk. So, we produce speech and so this is called speech production. Now, speech production can lead to speech production itself can lead to certain kind of errors which are called speech errors, interactions in which uh, the speaker uh, intends to say quite clearly, but the speaker makes some solutions or uh, substitutions or reorders the stimulus in a certain way. So, speech uh, errors then are certain substitutions or certain reordering of the statement which makes the sentence not legible. And so, these are hap these happens because uh, we do some kind of a reordering in sentence productions or we do some kind of a substitution in sentence production and those are called speech errors. For example, Mary keeps the food in her vest. Now, when we say vest actually this is wrong and so what has happened and so you would see these kind of things happening in smaller children and so what has happened here obviously you can see is the desk the d is replaced by the phoneme v and so what has happened is mary keeps food in her desk so instead of the desk the by production itself it becomes vesk and it happens to most of us we do these kind of problems another is uh, pro or another sentence which shows this kind of speech production error is this one where we sometimes make this kind of errors also, where what we have done is it is exchange of words. Sometimes we replace phonemes or sometimes we exchange words also. So, look at this sentence, we sit around the song and sing fire and so it happens to most of us you will realize that people who can speak English, they can have these kind of errors into it. And so, here what has happened is the song is replaced by fire. So, the actual sentence should be we sit around the fire and sing songs and so, out of some substitution in speech production, what has uh, happened is fire goes to the end of the sentence, song comes to the middle of the sentence and now sentence becomes we sit around the song and sing fires which has which is syntactically correct, it is semantically correct, but makes no meaning in, in, in it. So, in terms of pragmatics it makes no meanings. So, in terms of grammar rules it is perfectly correct, but it has no meaning and so this is an error of speech production. And this error arises because we substitute certain words for certain other words. Similarly, Garrett 1988 while studying such speech errors found that the word substitution has two broad categories of errors. So, this substitution of words, this exchange of words can then also be divided into two different classes, two huge classes out there. And what are these classes? One, a word substitution can error have. Um, a substitution error can happen in terms of meaning relations. So, in terms of meaning relations in the sense that I can substitute a word by another word which is equivalent to the meaning of the first word. So, here replacing finger with a toe or walk with a run is what meaning relations are there. So, finger and toe are more or less like similar in meaning. So, what finger does is what a toe would does and walk and run are more or less same in meaning, similar in meaning exactly not the same, but then similar in meaning and so people could actually do this kind of word substitution error and these word substitution, uh, substitution errors are meaning related errors or people can go ahead and form form relation errors. So, form relations errors are generally very uh, few and it is very few that you will see these kind of errors and so what you do here is instead of a guest you would say goat. So, the guest has come, the goat has come right or mushroom is replaced by moustache. So, let us go to the field and, and uh, uh, pick up fresh moustache instead of the mushroom. So, form relation errors can also exist and so Garrett says that these are two kinds of speech errors or speech related errors that can exist and so these speech related errors can also create or are also categorized into form relations and meaning relations okay so this is up till now we have seen that in the production of speech also so not only that writing language or written language has some kind of errors while producing speech also we create a number of errors and so what we saw up till now is how speech is produced and this production of categorical speech the production of speech itself which has which is categorical in nature this can also lead to certain kind of errors which the producer of the speech is making and which confuses the listener and so he would be uh, hearing something else right and so the question now is how do we comprehend a sentence right. So, when somebody writes a sentence how do we go ahead and read this sentence. So, how do people understand and recover their meaning from sentences. So, given the fact there are certain sentences written in fact uh, in front of you how do you make meaning from such a sentence. 
The answer to this lies in the fact that people pay attention to syntactic constituents. However, they do uh, do not process sentence clause by clause. So, what people generally do is that they look at a sentence and they look at parts of the sentence uh, or they look at the syntactic constraint of a sentence, right? but then they do not process a sentence clause by clause. So, what really they, they do? They actually look at a sentence look at the, uh, uh, the constituent of a sentence and make a gist out of it and that is how they process a sentence. They actually do not read the sentence clause by clause and that is the uh, way in which people uh, go ahead and process sentences. So, after reading a sentence what people do is they discard most of the words in the sentence and just keep the meaning the central representation or the rep uh, central meaning in terms of a gist representation. So, comprehending a sentence involves resolving its possible ambiguities. So, in sentence comprehension also certain kind of errors can occur and so it has been found that people are very good in resolving ambiguities. If a sentence uh, and we saw that in the first section also that even if the sentence has certain problems, people were able to resolve the ambiguity. For example, the first sentence that we looked at the very yellow dog chase something something, we saw that people are able to people although do not know the descriptive rules of grammar of how to correct the sentence, but they know the prescriptive rules and they know how to correct this. So, in terms of uh, sentence comprehension also people are very good in resolving these ambiguities. Now, in the interesting thing here is that we normally do not notice ambiguities and only rarely uh, we uh, come to notice them. Uh, when do we note ambiguities? Only when certain kind of sentences arise or certain um, uh, kind of certain parts of the sentence have uh, some confusions into us. Now, look at this sentence. The sentence says the horse race past the barn fell. Now, if you look into the sentence, what happens is initially the sentence is all right, the horse race past the barn till the point that you come to fell and fell is ambiguous and these kind of sentences are called garden path sentence. So, you it leads you to a certain direction of meaning, but then the last word creates a problem and so what is the problem? So, how do we go ahead and solve this? What is the this is obviously an ambiguity. So, how do you uh, solve this? One way to solve it is the horse rate, uh, raced past and put a comma here the barn fell two parts of the sentence two sentences to look at now makes meaning or the horse uh, raced past the barn fell can be broken down into this two constants and so uh, till the point of time that you are reading the horse raced past the barn it is ok, but fell the word fell itself is a problem and so here is the problem. So, you can solve it by this way and these type of sentences actually lead to ambiguities or look at this shirt. Now, this sentence says the cotton shirts are made from comes from Arizona. Now, from, from the beginning of the sentence if you read there is a pert, uh, pertinent meaning that you see to it, but at a point at certain point certain word arises which creates confusion. For example, the cotton shirts are made from comes from uh, Arizona. Now, there is a problem here. The cotton shirts are made from expects certain input as some form of it, all right. What form of cotton I am describing the kind of cotton qualifying the cotton example. So, simplifying the sentence or basically if you want to make meaning of the sentence and so the here is where. So, even from the start the cotton shirts are made from uh, made from comes from Arizona is where the problem really comes in. And so, if you want to solve this sentence the ambiguity ambiguity is this part of the sentence. So, if you want to solve the ambiguity what we really do is cotton shirts. Uh, the if we put a uh, comma here the cotton shirts are made from comes from Arizona then the sentence uh, loses is an um, uh, ambiguity and becomes a more meaningful sentence, but reading from from onwards into this way creates an ambiguity and so this kind of sentences creates ambiguity, but with normal ambiguity because what happens is the people have already started reading the sentence and so it has made people started thinking in a particular direction, but then from the from onwards or from the barn onwards the next word which appears creates confusions and so this kind of sentences make people. Uh, uh, um, assume confusions or make people think about confusions and they need to then solve the ambiguity. So, these sentences are then called garden path sentences the reason being that it starts making you think in a certain way and then at some point of uh, the sentence it pushes you into a different way right. 
So, results from several studies they suggest that when we process ambiguous sentences all the meaning of the sentences are temporarily available. So, when we are looking at uh, these kind of ambiguous sentences and ambiguous sentences which has multiple meaning the results from several experiments suggest that all meanings of the sentences are available. For example, if there is a sentence saying that uh, this room is uh, full of uh, bugs. Now, both the meaning of the bugs, uh, the bugs as in terms of cockroaches or pets or bugs in terms of listening devices are available to us. Depending on the context, we then decide after three phoneme length which word meaning will be accurate. And so, results from several studies basically suggest that. So, basically what it suggests is that when we are reading an ambiguous sentence, all the meaning of the ambiguous word, the word which is creating ambiguity are temporarily available through an automatic bottom up process. So, while reading a sentence, every meaning, uh, remember the sentence where we use bank in two different ways in, in terms of financial institutions and in terms of uh, uh, river front. Now, both the meaning are available if a sentence, if this bank is creating confusion in a sentence, both the meanings would be available at the time of processing the sentence. Now, context effects do not immediately restrict the listener to most appropriate reading of the word. So, basically when we are reading a sentence, the way a sentence is created, the context in which a sentence is created, it does not stop the reader from interpreting all the meanings of the ambiguous word. Right? Instead, for a short period, all meanings are accessible to them. Now, three syllables after the presentation of the ambiguous word, only one meaning remains active. So, what happens is the context does not decide what is the meaning of ambiguous word of the ambiguous word which is created the word which is creating ambiguity in ambiguous sentences. What really happens is three syllables after the processing of the ambiguous word all meanings are available. Only after these three syllables has elapsed the uh, exact meaning or the meaning which befits the context then remains and all other meanings are discarded. And so, researchers has been done on several kind of sentences and so, since this uh, we are not dealing in detail in language. So, I am not bringing in those examples which will show you how these experiments were done and how it was basically found out, but this is the result of it. So, three syllables after the presentation of the ambiguous word only one meaning remains active which is the meaning which is more up most appropriate to those contexts suggesting that people resolve sentence ambiguity fairly quickly. So, no matter how ambiguous a sentence is, people are able to resolve these ambiguities. And how do they do this resolving of ambiguity? The fact is they read the sentence to the point they come to the fact that the word which is creating ambiguity and when they are reading the word which is creating ambiguity, context is the word, the context of the sentence does not help them. Till three phonemes or three syllables after the presentation of the word all meanings are accessible, but only after three syllable presentations which is a very very brief time only after that the appropriate meaning or the necessary meaning or the most optimal meaning which befits that sentence is remains and all other meaning goes away and certain experiments were done to create that. And so, what does it actually tell you? It tell you that people are able to read up ambiguous sentences very fast and resolve ambiguity very fast. Right? So, although all meanings are available, but then people are very good in resolving ambiguities. Although may, they may not know the grammar, they may not know what is wrong with a sentence, but they may that they can correct the sentence. So, they have this feeling, they have this implicit feeling uh, that is that is what we saw in the first lecture. They say they have this implicit idea of what is wrong, but they may not know the grammar of where it is wrong. Okay. So, up till now we have looked at speech perception and sentence comprehension. Very good. Let us now look at what is comp uh, the comprehension of a text passage or how text passages are comprehended. Now, for understanding how people process text passages, first we need to know how people actually read. So, what is the way in which people read? And Justin Carpenter 1987 used something called an eye tracker to monitor the eye fixations for written text. So, what they did was they used something called an eye tracker. So, eye tracker actually uh, tracks the movement of the eyeball as it moves across written words. And so, from that they had some idea of how people actually read. Now, results indicate that reading consists of a series series of fixations and jump uh, across text with average fixation and jump being 250 and uh, uh, and 10 to 20 in 10 to the power minus 3 uh, second. So, basically 250 uh, 
to uh, 10 to 20, 20 millisecond kind of a uh, time frame. So, basically then what they found out from the study is that people just do not read text the way it is. What happens is the eyeball tracking experiment suggests that people jump from word to word and they then have fixations. So, when they are looking at a word they look at the first word they fixate it, they look at the last letter of the word they stop there for some time make meaning out of it jump to the next first uh, next letter or next word the first letter of the next word last letter of the next word look at the context find meaning next makes the jumps and make another jump into it. And so, this kind of jumping and fixations are how text is perceived. Now, Justin Carpenter's model assumed that as soon as readers uh, encounter a new word they try to interpret it and assign it a role. Uh, and this is called the immediate as, uh, immediacy assumption. So, in text passaging what Justin Carpenter says is that when we are reading something and this fixation happens between the first letter and the last letter of the word and then we wait there for a certain time that is called the fixation time and then we jump to the next word which is there. Now, during this period when we make this jump this fixation and jump during that period we immediately encounter when we encounter that word we immediately gather the meaning of the word and that is called the immediacy assumption. So, as soon as we uh, get a new word we try to interpret what the word is. The author also formulated something called the I mind hypothesis and so what is it which holds that interpretation of each word occurs during the time it is fixated. So, basically what then what happens is when reading a text there are certain jumps that the eye actually does. And so, if you are reading at words like w r d s and like these are the two things that we are looking the eye will first fixate here stay here then look at the last word d s then there is a context in it since it is the language context and so words are related to context. So, we are teaching this I am teaching this in in a lecture on language and so the context is there and so this w uh, word starting with w ending with s or ending with d would be a word uh, that is how the immediate subs uh, immediacy assumption is and so immediately that is what it is and the i mind hypothesis says that as the fixation happens and uh, before the jump this word is interpreted this word is matched with uh, uh, a segment or matched with a representation into the brain and a meaning is extracted out of it. And so, these are what it is. So, immediacy says that uh, uh, interpretation is, uh, 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 is done as soon as the fixation happens and a role is assigned to it and the I mind hypothesis says that meaning is also extracted at the same point of time. So, it is not only the role assigning to new word what is the role of that new word whether it is a verb whether it is a noun whether it is a pronoun what kind what form it is uh, uh, doing in a sentence or what is the role that is playing in a sentence that is called the immediacy assumption the i mind hypothesis says that the meaning is also extracted at that very time with the fixation time so fixation tells you what each word mean what is the role it has in the sentence and what and, uh, and, and uh, how to interpret this 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 role and the I mind hypothesis says that also the meaning of the word is extracted at that point in time and that is how we read. So, this through these fixations and jumps across words to words is how we actually read and that is how comprehension of text passages happen. Now, just in Carpenter they argued that a number of variables influence fixa uh, uh, influences fixation duration. So, the time num the amount of time that the I fixates on to a particular word is influenced by a number of variables. And so, what are these variables? Uh, for example, word length, the bigger the word length, the more the fixation has to be, right. Also, word frequency, how frequently you see this word. So, words like apricot, words like aloe vera, words uh, which people do not encounter in everyday life they require longer fixations than word like cat, dog, hen, food that kind of words which are more common the word frequency the usage of these words are more common and syntactically and semantically ambiguous words. So, if words are syntactically and semantically am ambiguous for example, bank two meanings of bank or bugs two meanings of the word bugs or multiple meaning of the uh, word bug or the position of the word is such that it can also be an adjective and it can also be a noun uh, that can happen. So, the word could qualify it could mean uh, too many things into it in those cases the fixations are long uh, or the fixations are of larger duration and the jumps are then quick uh, not quicker it takes more time to jump and the more longer fixation because that determines how much time you have to spend into it. Why? Because then you have to first if uh, we have uh, uh, words which are 
ambiguous we have to first assign a rule to it because that rule will tell you what this word means and what this word uh, how this word is driving the sentence right and so basically that so longer the word uh, the more uh, complex the word lesser the frequency more the fixation period Kintish and Kinan 73, they found out the semantic factors influence the reading task. There are certain semantic factors which also go ahead and influence text comprehension or reading task. They showed that two sentences of equal length might be differential, uh, differentially difficult to process. And so, they said that the semantic, the meaning, how much meaning a sentence carries, how much ideas that a sentence carries, that will also decide how easily a sentence can be read. So, those sentences which has a number of ideas onto them, they will be difficult to understand, they will take more time to comprehend or comprehension of sentences which have multiple ideas embedded into them will take more time than sentences which have simple ideas. And so, pre they presented something like this. Uh, so, the word is Romulus. Uh, the word is Romulus, the legendary founder of Rome, took the woman uh, of, of the Sabine by force. And so, there are two or three ideas into it. And so, you uh, look into Romulus, woman and by force are three ideas. And then you have Sabine is a woman. Uh, these are two other things. And so, the number of ideas are limited here, three ideas. And so, it takes some time to process. In comparison to that, if you look into it, it is the same length. The second sentence is also the same length, but here the number of ideas are more and so it takes more time to process. And what is the uh, sentence? Cleopatra's downfall lay in a foolish trust in the fickle political figure of the Roman world. And so, if you look into it, there are multiple ideas into it or multiple segments into it. Now, because of what? Because of trust of Cleopatra, Cleopatra fell down. And within that, within the trust, what kind of trust? There is a foolish trust, there is a fickle trust and there is the part of the world. So, that is related to the Cleopatra and figure in, in one idea and Cleopatra falling down is the other idea. So, trusting of Cleopatra is one idea and the falling down of Cleopatra is another idea and within that there are certain systems which are there and if you look into it, it has multiple ideas. right? And so, if it has multiple ideas, it will take more time to process. And so, the more meaning, more ideas that have, the more meaning is to be interpreted, the more meaning of sentence has, the more time it will take to be interpreted and the more uh, fixations are required into it and uh, the longer duration of comprehension for such words would occur. Now, another factor which influences the processing of text has to do with relationship among sentences. What sentences or how sentences are related to each other? So, the more uh, the sentences are related to each other, the larger the relationship or uh, if the two sentences are not related to each other, then it will take more time to be processed. Now, Halliwell and Clark 1974 describe something called a given new strategy. And what is this given new strategy? They say that whereby listeners are uh, 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 listeners and readers divide sentences into two parts, the given part and the new part. So, when they are listening into a sentence, when people who listen to a sentence, they are listening into a sentence, they immediately divide the sentence into two parts. One is the given part, the other is the new part. Now, the given part of a sentence contains information that is familiar from the context of the preceding information or the background information. So, when you are listening to a sentence, what you tend to do is break the sentence into its two parts. First part is the given part. The given part has all the information or so, given part has all the inputs from preceding context or from where the from borrow over effect from previous sentences and people are familiar with it. The new part contains unfamiliar information. New part of the sentence they can contain unfamiliar information. So, listeners first search memory for information current corresponding to the given information and update memory by incorporating uh, the new information offered as an elaboration of the given part. So, basically then uh, let us look at a sentence and then see how does this thing really work. So, basically what I am doing is I am uh, creating two sentences and uh, with a given part and a new part. So, if I write this sentence, we got some beer out of the car. This is the first part and the second part is the beer was warm. So, sentence number 1, sentence number 2, right? This is the given part and this is the new part. Similarly, we checked the 
picnic supplies and then again the same this is the given part and the beer was warm. Now, in which case do you think people will take more time to comprehend? Yes, you are right. In the first case, people will take lesser time to comprehend this sentence. The reason being that in the given sentence, in the given part of the sentence, the mention of beer is there and so it makes a relation with this sentence and so your comprehension is easy. So, basically they got some beer out of the car and so they were warm and easy to interpret. But in this case, the mention of beer is not there in the first sentence and so you do not know how the new part connects to the old part and so then first you have to make the assumption that beer is part of the picnic supplies, first you have to make this supposition assumption only then you can comprehend this sentence and in this case it is easy because previous context provide you that idea and so if this is a given new sentence people will take lesser time to verify this one then uh, this one because the first part of the sentence contains the referral to the new part right so this is basically what they say so in a in a uh, given new strategy the more different the given and new parts are the more difficult comprehension turns out to be. Now, Van de Broek and, uh, and Gustafsson in 1990, they offered three conclusions from research on reading text. First, the mental representation is a construction by the reader which differs from and goes beyond the information of the text itself. When you read something and that is why I always advise my students to read books. What happens is when you read something, you make a new world out of it and a new construction you go beyond uh, the book and imagine things which is not written even in the uh, text. And so, people own this mental imagery and so, in the, in the last chapter on mental imagery, we saw that people have this mental imagery, make these mental representations in visual form. So, once you read a text, people make certain imageries or certain text or certain kind of formats which are personal to them and so, they go beyond the what is written in the word and that becomes personal to us. And so, these personal things, this, these personal influences, representations that we make of text help us in understanding something. So, when people read something, they create a mental representation which is personal to them and it is beyond what is written onto the text. The second is the representation is coherent. When we read text, the representations have to be coherent in the sense that it is linked in ways, right. So, one part of the sentence text should always be related to the second part and that is coherency is there. So, even if we read uh, like if we are reading a novel, we read the back part first and the front part in the middle of the novel, we still make this coherency, the fill up gaps is there and this coherency is always maintained. And the third is res, uh, readers attentional resources are limited. We cannot be very ambiguous in writing sentences. If we write very, very ambiguous sentences, the attention span of the resources is limited, text comprehension will be Lord. So, when writing a text for comprehending, you should be assured of the fact that first whatever we are writing people are uh, there, people will misinterpret it or people will create their own constructions out of it. So, it should be very uh, limited, it should, it should be written in a way that it should give the chance for uh, lesser uh, representation, varied representation. Also, the representation that we form, the writing that we do should be coherent, it should not be all over the place having all kind of meanings into it and third, that it should be written very strictly in ways that uh, respect people's attentional resources, the, which basically means that the idea should be clearly sprayed out. If it is not, then people's attentional resources are very limited and so, we will keep on jumping from one uh, meaning to others. Right then, so this is how text, text comprehension happens. Now, let us look at an interesting fact, which is stories. How do people comprehend stories? We have looked at how people comprehend text. Now, let us look at how people comprehend stories. So, what is the way in which people actually read stories? And so, for reading story, it has been found that there is something called story grammars. So, story grammars are described as the way in which people comprehend large integrated pieces of text using script schemas and grammar of the language. So, while reading a story, while reading a novel, while reading some kind of art work, work or fiction or non-fiction, when reading any kind of large text which they need to comprehend, they use certain kind of grammars which is different from the kind of grammar that we uh, saw in the first part of this lecture. What is it then? 
So, what are story grammars? These are similar to scripts in that both have variables or slots that are filled in differentially by different uh, stories. So, basically story grammar is kind of a script right, it is kind of a block and so th what this block does is it this block says that each story should have certain fixed factors into it right. So, what story grammar suggests is that people expect certain kind of fixed factors. So, for example, when we are looking at a story, each story should have a protagonist, the person who is the one who is acting the main component of the story or the main person of the story, then it should have a setting where the story is setting from, where it is coming from, where it is based on a plot or what really happens in the story, what is the baseline of the story, background of the story, conflicts and resolutions. Then if we are writing a story, there has to be some kind of a conflict and then the storyteller resolves this conflict and all these are expectations that people have and these are called story grammars. So, every story should have things like this, these type of grammars onto it. Now, story grammars are similar to syntactic grammars in that they help us identify the units uh, of each role plays in uh, the story. So, basically like what grammar does for us, what syntax does for us, because syntax tell you in a sentence what is the subject, what is the object and what is the verb and what role each object is playing in a sentence and that helps you into making a legal sentence. Similarly, story grammars actually tell you the main constituents of the story, what is the protagonist, who is the protagonist, what is the plot, what is the setting, what is the tone, uh, what are the conflicts which are there, what are the resolutions, so that you come to know in, in one brief look into it what the story is about or what the story is going to tell you right. And so, these, these are fixed factors, it is story grammars are like syntactic rules for grammar. Now, story grammars they provide a framework with which to expect certain elements and sequences and to fill with default values things are not explicitly stated. So, basically story grammar then tells you that any story has to have these things. Now, if it is not if something is not explicitly mentioned here we fill it implicitly to make a story. Let us look into what story grammars is. So, this is basically a story of uh, the three little pigs. Now, obviously when I say a story of the three little pigs there are certain expectations that people have. What will the story have right and so first of all there should be character the protagonist and the protagonist is there has to be first of all if it is a story about three little pigs. So, three little pigs have to be there that is the main thing and then if the three little pigs are there just three little pigs going around is not going to solve a problem. So, conflict has to be made and uh, for a conflict and a villain has to be an anti hero has to be in uh, put in and that is what the wolf is. So, story grammars then give you this idea that only the hero is not going to make up a story. So, some kind of a villain has to be brought in anti hero is to be brought in because the anti hero and hero when they collide will produce the kind of problems or the kind of um, difficulties contradictions which has to be resolved later on because most stories work around this way. And so, I have now created a wolf. Now, obviously, if there is a villain and there is a hero, then there is some kind of problem has to arise because they do not cannot heroes and villains cannot live together. And so, what is the problem here? The wolf wants to eat the three little pigs. Now, we have a story in, in condition. So, we have a problem, we have certain characters into it, we have all the characters into it and we have a title of it. So, let us then write the story certain events into it. And so, we can fill it. So, what uh, what I have done is we have put in some. So, wind blows the house, wolf blows down the straw house, then wolf blow down the stick house, wolf cannot blow down the brick house, wolf climbs the chimney. And so, these are the three kind of houses these, these pigs have they live in. And so, once the wolf goes ahead and blows it, the, uh, the, the pigs create a new kind of a uh, house. Why they could create a new kind of house? Because they are afraid of this particular wolf and they does, do not want to be eaten and so this is the fund, uh, this is the is a set of events. You can create any kind of event just as the uh, look into it. And then the resolution is wolf falls into a pot of boiling water runs out or, or the open door and is never seen again. So, the resolution is the wolf is going to eat the uh, pigs. So, the resolution is these pigs were actually boiling water and the wolf comes down a chimney falls onto the water burns himself and says that no I am not going to do this again learns his lesson and goes away and never uh, uh, returns back again. So, this is how a story is created this is how situations is created certain contradictions are created and so on and so forth. On this side you will see 
the sori structure and recall and so i leave it to you to actually read so basically there are different kind of uh, things in a story for example what it is what is the event structure of the event episode beginning development simple reaction and so on and so forth so basically then most stories have these kind of fill in gaps and so this is how a story grammar really works and so what is the uh, need for a story grammar because it gives us certain kind of insight of how a story is going to work and then if something is missing we can always go ahead and fill that particular thing now looking at something called gracious maxima conversation up till now we have looked at something called speech how it is perceived what is grammar what is sentence perception all those things but there are certain maxims of conversation there are certain rules of conversation which needs to be followed and so gracian gives these maxims so grace 1975 believe that for people for con to converse each must do more than just produce utterances that uh, that is phonological sound they must syntactically and semantically produce sound which are appropriate for example if you look into two sentences i just heard that joe got promoted today isn't that great if a is saying and b says so salt lake city is located uh, located in utah and the third is charles darwin is the father of modern evolution they are not conversing at all there is no conversation although all the sentences here are semantically correct syntactically correct have meaning but they are not following the conversation so there are certain rules of conversation so what is it what is the and the, again the a comes up with the answer then what is the square root of 34 b says that chocolate ice cream is sweet so basically this is not a how a conversation is uh, is actually progressing and so grais described the speaker in a conversation uh, should actually produce uh, some kind of a maxim so follow some kind of a rules into it the uh, four maxims are there first is the quantity whenever we speak we should speak in terms of quantity we should not speak more we should not speak less but we should speak enough for example somebody ask you uh, the time and you say 4 o'clock this is not quantity because 4 o'clock could be morning 4 o'clock could be evening so you should have give him enough information not too much information but enough information then quality quality in the sense that whatever you are saying should have uh, some kind of a context some kind of a quality into it if there is no quality that you have into your speech if you have uh, no context into your speech or uh, no meaning into your speech then it will not be processed in the right way then you have maximum of uh, maximum of relation if you are speaking a sentence and two parts of the sentence make no relation so i am going to the i am going to the the market and uh, uh, sun, the sun is shining on my head and the two sentences have no relation with each other. So, when you are saying two sentences or when you are saying a sentence, both the parts of the sentence should have some relation and so this maximum of relation should be always followed. It should not be avoided, it should not be constant. So, people should have or speak sentences which have relationships or which express relationships into each other. And four is the maximum of manner. We should always have good manners. If you are speaking in the wrong manner, so if you are speaking to somebody who is elder than you and you say come here sit down, that is not a manner to which is to be done. Similarly speaking to people who are smaller than you. So, certain uh, maxims are to be followed if it is some, somebody who is senior to you who is uh, for old age, please use words like please or some kind of respect has to be given and these are the maxims which is there. Similarly, if you are referring to people who are below of your age or of similar age it is ok, but of below age then you will have to uh, use some kind of a mannerism into it if you do not then you are not known to be a nice social person and so if violation of rule a and b is there then people are called uncooperative and obnoxious so just telling you something like uh, uh, giving parts and bits of information or no quality information no meaning information at all then people are known to be uncooperative and obnoxious and people violating rule c are known to be bizarre because if you do not say relations if you just keep on saying things then they are bizarre in nature ok then so what influences this language have an other cognitive process up till now we have seen what is the language and what and how it is related to different cognitive processes so what is the influence that these language or the language has on different cognitive processes so uh, there are two ways to look into it first language and other cognitive processes operate independently one view says that and the second is language and other cognitive processes are dependent on each other and both of this view one view says that they are separate language has nothing to do with other cognitive process and the other view says that they are integrated together and both of these are further explained by two popular hypotheses of uh, uh, language in uh, uh, in language cognition one of these hypotheses is called the modularity hypothesis and so what does this hypothesis actually say so it was proposed by john freder philosopher uh, jerry foder in 1982 uh, 85 
in argued that some cognitive process in particular perception and language they are modular. So, they process or they do processing in a modular formula modularity of a process. So, what is modularity then? Modularity of a process says that it is domain specific operates specifically with certain kind of input. So, language then is modular because it operates only through certain kind of inputs. If you give the wrong input language is not going to work. Similarly, with perception if you give the wrong input perception is not going to be uh, uh, taking place and so for perception to play, take place a certain kind of input has to be given. And the second is informationally encapsulated which basically means that operates independent of the believer and other people's information available to the processor. No matter what people believe language is independent, the processing of language is independent. What we say is obviously independent dependent on the context or what we believe, but the processing of language if somebody says something to you how it is processed that is in informationally, uh, informationally encapsulated which means that language processors do not depend on people's belief system or their expectations to process things. And so, this is how language is independent or language is not dependent on other cognitive process. So, basically then modularity hypothesis or uh, Foda's view is that language is modular in nature and that is why it is not related to any other because it has specific inputs defined and only specific inputs is going to work and also the fact that it processing is not dependent on people's belief systems, their expectations, their views and so on and so forth. In, in direct opposition to this there is the Wufferian hypothesis, Wuffer by, uh, by example or Wuff, uh, uh, Benjamin Worf was actually a chemical engineer and so he gave the idea that language has to be related with other uh, different kind of cognitive process which is out there. And so, what did he say? He said that uh, language and other cognitive process are strongly related. He believes that language development has a lot to do with the kind of atmosphere or the kind of environment where somebody is born with. And so, the environment in which you are born shapes your language, right. So, somebody coming from a, a, a very rich environment will have a different kind of language in, comp in uh, comparison to people who are coming from uh, lower social economy backgrounds, people who are coming from those backgrounds where the language is not enriched and so their thinking, their language, their whole idea would change because the environment forces it. And so, he believes that language as one grows up learning and speaking organizes and directs the way when perceives the world, organizes information about the world around you. That happens because the world around you gives you a different nature of uh, uh, the world uh, interaction with you or your interaction with the world gives you a different kind of feeling, a different kind of uh, thought process and this thought process will then change the way language uh, is there. And so, when you see somebody from the street, the way he speaks, the way his thought processes and somebody from very uh, elite background, when you speak, look at, you, at his speech and the way he speaks, both are different. And so, this is the interpretation of the difference, the differences which is there. So, basically then in this section on language what we did does we continued from the earlier section where we looked at what is uh, uh, language and what are the parts of the language and we proceeded by explaining how language comprehension is done or basically how lang uh, how speech is produced. So, we looked at what is speech production and how it is produced and what are the errors can that can arise in production of speech. We also looked at comprehension of text messages and comprehension of sentences and grammars. We then looked at some principles of better communication of how people should be speaking and then finally, we looked at a very popular debate the modularity versus the non modularity or the debate between the fact that language is like other cognitive process and so it is interacting with them against the debate that language is different from other cognitive process and should not be interacting. So, this is the basic overview that we did in language. We studied what is uh, language, how it is uh, produced, what are the rules for it and so on and so forth. Later we saw how it is uh, the production of language, the errors that happens with the production of language, uh, the uh, comprehension, how comprehension of spoken and written language happens and then the errors that can arise there and then we looked at how stories are perceived and to end with we looked at a famous uh, modular versus word debate into uh, language comprehension and language uh, cognition. Thank you.